One of the biggest innovations in automotive history derived from Formula One technological breakthroughs is in every modern car since 1996, and it's all thanks to California. It's regulated to be no more than two feet from your steering wheel, and this obscure data link connection goes by the name OBD2. It stands for Onboard Diagnostic, and it is a gateway into your vehicle's central nervous system, giving you access to real-time data on engine speed, vehicle speed, sensor data, steering angle, diagnostic codes, and the list goes on and on. An issue that starts as a check engine light or service engine soon illumination on the dash can quickly be solved after reading the diagnostic trouble code, which shows what kind of problem, which subsystem it's in, and with certain scan tools, even how to fix it. This little port was initially implemented to monitor the integrity of emission systems and vehicles to abide by the Federal Clean Air Act amendments, but in an ironic twist of fate, it would be the perfect gateway that aided in the explosion of the flash tuning industry, which worked against the original purpose entirely. From its inception nearly 30 years ago, it has remained largely unchanged. It has become the perfect entry point for bad actors to gain access to a myriad of controls of your vehicle and you possibly losing access to the car in your driveway. This isn't a story of some unobtainable car that many of us dream about. This is a story of a measly little data link port that shaped an entire industry for the better and also for the worse. Welcome to Explain. This all started with the Clean Air Act of 1970. We shall intensify our research, set increasingly strict standards, and strengthen enforcement procedures, and we should do it now. With strong bipartisan support, the Clean Air Act of 1970 was signed into law, which gave the newly created Environmental Protection Agency considerable discretion and authority to set and change regulations and to enforce compliance with emission standards. While stationary polluters like refineries and power plants could use readily available technology to reduce emissions, automobiles would have to literally invent and engineer their way into compliance, a very heavy-handed style of regulation that would send automakers into a panic. The compression ratios of engines were lowered, decreasing cylinder pressure and reducing nitrogen oxide emissions with horsepower and torque outputs taking a negative hit. Air fuel ratios were leaner to further reduce NOx emissions. Carburetors were tamper proof, and exhaust gas recirculation systems, which displace the oxygen with spent exhaust gases to further lower NOx emissions, essentially killed power output, single handedly ended the muscle car arms race, and funny enough, they still failed emissions tests regularly, especially in California, which had the strictest emissions regulations. The only glimmer of hope to survive in this innovate or die regulatory environment for automakers was a late 19th century technology patented by French engineer Eugene Howdry, known as the catalytic converter. These early two-way oxidation catalysts used platinum and palladium coated cores that when at operating temperature oxidize harmful carbon monoxide molecules to harmless carbon dioxide and unburnt fuel hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide and water and later three-way catalysts would add a reduction core made from platinum and rhodium to lower NOx emissions by 90%. But it had an inherent flaw. If the air-fuel ratio was too rich, the excess hydrocarbons would elevate the temperature of the substrate in the converter to the point of meltdown and destroy the catalyst altogether. The need for monitoring and feedback of these emission systems would be necessary for catalyst longevity, and Bosch's KU Jettronic system introduced in the Volvo 265 was an early example of tackling this issue head on, using a lambda sensor which meters the level of oxygen in the exhaust system and reports it to the ECU to maintain a proper air fuel ratio at idle and light engine loads, which helped immensely with catalyst longevity. The government forced complication of adding emissions components rose the need for onboard diagnostic capabilities, and Formula One had already been making strides in that arena. 
for McLaren, onboard data acquisition and storage was crucial to dialing in their race cars. McLaren technicians would download the data from the onboard memory after a single lap since the memory was only big enough for one lap's worth of data. So during the race, the driver would be given a signal on the pit board to turn on the telemetry for a particular lap, and the data would then be downloaded off the car when it returned to the garage to diagnose issues and further improve lap times. This would trickle down into road cars, initially the luxury cars like the 1980 Cadillac Eldorado's digital EFI computer that when it ran into an issue, it would trip a check engine light and store a trouble code that could be accessed by holding the warm and off buttons on the climate control display. This would display the active codes that were a two digit code from 00 to 99 that corresponded to a list found in the owner's manual of pre-programmed trouble codes. For example, code 55 would indicate a faulty oxygen sensor or code 71 would indicate a faulty brake light switch, which quickly guided a technician or owner to the problem or at least the symptom. In another step forward in advanced technology, all 1981 Chevrolets equipped with gasoline engines will feature the remarkable new computer command control system. A year later, General Motors would introduce computer command control in new cars, which was a proprietary 5-pin and 12-pin diagnostic port that was interfaced to the ECU, and when a check engine light appeared and a diagnostic tool was connected, the check engine light would flash in a sequence corresponding to a specific code stored in the ECU. It also had a serial data stream on pin E to monitor real-time sensor data and communicate overrides to actuate components for testing and diagnosis. Quickly, all manufacturers would follow suit. Ford Motor Company, Chrysler, Daimler-Benz, BMW, they would all create proprietary diagnostic ports, protocols, procedures, codes, tools, and it got really, really complicated. The Society of Automotive Engineers, or SAE, recommended standardization of the data link connector port, location of the DLC port, protocols, and trouble code identification to address the increasing complication. This would be resolved in 1994 when the California Air Resources Board would require all cars sold starting in 1996 to use onboard diagnostic version 2. This new OBD2 port, which was required to be within two feet of the steering wheel, was a 16 contact design where contacts 1, 3, 8, 9, and 11 and 13 were left up to the manufacturer's discretion. Contacts 2, 6, 7, 10, 14, and 15 were for diagnostic communication, and the 16th was a permanent positive voltage. Diagnostic codes were now standardized using a five-digit system, where the first digit identified which system the code was related to, either powertrain, the chassis, the body, or the network. The second digit identified if the code was an SAE generic code or a manufacturer-specific code, and the third digit specified the subsystem denoted from zero to F and the fourth and fifth digit is a unique code identifier between 00 and 99. For example, a PO143 diagnostic trouble code, which is an oxygen sensor low voltage code, will start with P for powertrain, zero for SAE, one for emission subsystem, and 43 for the unique fault code index. This new OBD2 architecture would communicate with five different protocols, General Motors using variable pulse width, Ford using pulse width modulation, Chrysler and import vehicles commonly using ISO 9141-2, keyword 2000, and Bosch's CAN bus or controller area network-based protocol to communicate with the diagnostic equipment. CAN was a superior communication method for cars introduced in the W140 chassis S-Class Mercedes, a car that for 1991 was at the cutting edge of technological integration. It connects all the ECUs or nodes together to communicate with one another on a shared bus. And in the case of modern cars like a BMW 5 Series, where the battery has a controller, the infotainment, the mirrors, the cameras, communication between them is critical. On the physical layer, the CAN low and CAN high voltages determine if a bit is zero or one on the data stream. And even in the presence of electrical interference, the signals will maintain the same voltage difference, making it ideal for cars that encounter constant barrages of interference on the road. On the data link layer, communication is done with CAN frames, which have multiple message fields that indicate a message is starting, which node is talking, whether it's sending or requesting data, how much data to expect, 
the data payload, which then can be decoded, the CRC to ensure data integrity, acknowledgement that the data has been received, and then the end of the frame. This is how CAN bus communicates messages between sometimes 70 or more ECUs on the bus. While the sole purpose of onboard diagnostics was to maintain the integrity of emission systems, it became the perfect access point to the engine's computer and software engineers with a knack for performance tuning began to build tuning tools for popular vehicles like Mustangs, Camaros, Corvettes and WRXs, Hondas and especially diesels. The ability to make additional power with tuning alone with a stock naturally aspirated engine is futile. The original manufacturer already bakes in the most ignition timing possible for the fuel quality and then uses knock sensors to retard the timing when detonation occurs at peak cylinder pressures. Tuning is useful when hardware is changed. Adding more aggressive camshafts changes the efficiencies of the engine, where you lose volumetric efficiency at low RPM, meaning fuel needs to be pulled from down low and added up top, so remapping the VE table is required. This is true with unrestricted exhaust systems, ported and polished intakes and cylinder heads, adding a supercharger or a turbocharger. This all changes the fueling and ignition timing requirements, idling targets and rev limits, thus making tuning a necessity and plugging a dongle into the OBD2 port using a tuning tool like HP tuners and reflashing the ECU. This made the OBD2 port just as important to tuners than its original purpose of maintaining the integrity of emission systems and is the main reason the tuning market exploded in the early 2000s. The range of use for this port extended past just tuning. Manufacturers use this port to access every module in the vehicle in an effort to shed cost and more profit. Even the security systems can be accessed through this port. Every modern car has a back door or a method of sidestepping normal authentication procedures to gain unauthorized access to a system. For example, in the rare case you lose all your keys in a boating accident, a locksmith or dealership after verifying ownership of the vehicle can access the pin code stored in the car's security module by using the OBD2 port with a key programmer and then use it to reprogram new key fobs for the vehicle. This back door being necessary so a car isn't bricked when the keys are lost is also an exploit for bad actors wanting access to use your car for nefarious activities. Our Fairfax County police officers say they found a key reprogramming kit on two people while arresting them for allegedly stealing a vehicle. This issue is very prevalent in the metropolitan area of Houston, Texas where every day GMC Sierras, Yukon Denali, Silverados, Escalades, and even Corvettes are on a daily basis commandeered by thieves using key programmers and intimate knowledge of the vehicle's construction, quickly thwarting the locks, cutting the wires to the horn, and using blank keys to take a $90,000 truck that will probably never be seen again in one piece. If you were to look at the most stolen vehicles in America, Behind cheap cars like Hyundais and Kias made famous by the Kia boys, it's the Chevrolet Silverado. And since GM is the master of badge engineering, the same security system in this truck is identical across around 10 different models. This is just one example of how smart and sophisticated modern car theft is. No longer a game of screwdrivers in the ignition cylinder and sparking wires under the dash. So what does the future hold for onboard diagnostics? Well, in this current era of EPA and government overreach, OBD3 is something that has been cooking up in the background. This is the idea of a vehicle phoning home when emissions equipment is compromised or bypassed, which the vehicle's registration can be revoked, shorter emissions test intervals as a repeat offender, or even fines in the mail for driving distances with compromised emissions equipment. And the telltale signs are already happening. A man by the name Ken Dahl saw his insurance premiums increase by 21% and his leased Chevy Bolt built by General Motors reported the trip data to LexisNexis, which is a New York-based global data broker that serves the auto insurance industry. 
Mr. Dahl was able to obtain an 130 page report from LexisNexis with over 640 trips over a six month period with start and end times, distances, and if hard acceleration and hard braking occurred, which was used to adjust his insurance premiums. Now imagine this when it comes to emissions equipment. Since defeat devices are a finable offense up to $5,000 per install, if the manufacturer creates traps in the ECU to detect tampering that then reports it to the EPA, you can have fines being mailed to you after downloading the manufacturer's app to use the remote start feature on your deleted diesel. This is the scary future of onboard diagnostics. Without this breakthrough, the automotive landscape would be a lot less interesting. There would be no downloading an email and adding 100 horsepower or adding fuel efficiency while towing with your diesel helping the environment. But like all things in life, it just takes a couple bad apples to ruin the bunch.